two-year-old Paul's really above the age limit for this kind of cagey caper, still Sally gets a kick out of life when he's around. Because we live in 2024, we often forget what went on back in the day. If that's the case for you, you're in for a treat. In an attempt to prevent fatal injuries in football, I have invented this new type football helmet. Join us as we look at 23 strange old videos you must watch because they will change your view of the past. 23. Getting contacts fitted. Being fitted for contact lenses isn't a difficult or uncomfortable procedure. After a few minutes in the optician's chair, you'll be out the door with your prescription in hand. However, it was not so easy in the early days of contacts. In the 1940s, the suckers were thick, made of glass, and came with an outrageously uncomfortable looking fitting procedure. To achieve the exact shape of the lens, the optician had to squish some impression forming slime onto your eyeball using the end of a suction cup type apparatus. It was like having a dental impression done, but on your eyeball. After the impressions were taken, trained workers began making, sanding, and filing little discs of glass for users to insert into their eye sockets. The newsreel even refers to the lenses as glasses, and the model appears to be uncomfortable wearing them. At least the external glasses did not have to be removed from their eyes every six hours. 22. Soviet Robots This video depicts the final of the all-union robot competition, which was conducted in Russia during the summer of 1967. Sapulka, the legendary robot guide, is on the far right and currently lives in the Moscow Polytechnic Museum. In the foreground is the competition winner, the robot Neptune, which was built by a group of students from GPTU-9 in Kaliningrad directed by electrical engineer Boris Vasilenko. Another intriguing detail is related to this competition. Ala Pugacheva made her central television debut with her song Robot during the all-union robot competition. On the left, you may see a future Soviet stage diva. By happenstance, Kaliningrad, Pugacheva, the robots Sapolka and Neptune, and the entire USSR, with its trust in scientific and technical advancement, were twisted in time. Our thumbnail is strange to say the least. On the left pick, we can see what baby cages looked like back in the day. We will discuss this concept in more detail later. On the right pick, it's a pick of the people who participated in the world's ugliest man competition. I guess these men were proud contestants. 21. Female Bodybuilding During the mid-20th century, there were several unusual weight loss trends. In the 1940s, women visited slenderizing salons, where machines claiming to shape their bodies were utilized such as the Slendo Massager, the Walton Belt Vibrator, and the Vita Master Fat Massager. The vibrating workout belt was devised in the 1800s, but it did not achieve popularity until the 1930s and again in the 1950s. Research suggests that body vibration activities are not effective for weight loss, but it seems that most people did not want to put forth the effort to lose weight. Everyone wants a shortcut, but that's just not how life works. 20. Car Catcher since Londoner Bridget Driscoll became the first pedestrian to die in an automobile accident in 1896, businesses have raced to tackle the problem of automotive deaths. The pedestrian catcher, introduced in the 1930s, was a particularly creative approach. This device, sometimes known as the safety scoop or car catcher, was created to prevent pedestrian deaths indefinitely. The contraption included a grooved roller attached to the car's extension beam. When deactivated, it functioned like a bumper. When a pedestrian was in danger of being hit, the driver simply pulled a lever and the grooved roller descended to the ground. One of the creators demonstrates catching a jaywalker with a pedestrian catcher in the video. When the scoop is open, the jaywalker simply cannot be run over, and perhaps it is more than he deserves. The pedestrian catcher, however, was not as infallible as advertised. If the car was driving too fast or the driver didn't pull the lever quickly enough, the pedestrian was in jeopardy. A few more types were tested, including a shovel on a car in Paris in 1924 and another pedestrian catcher that imprisoned individuals on car hoods in 1974. 19. Hamster Wheel In the early 1930s, the car of the future only had one wheel. That wheel represented the entire car. The Dynosphere, as inventor Dr. J. H. Purvez referred to it, provided a cabin within the circumference of the wheel for the driver and passenger to sit. 
Tracks wrapped around the whole inside of the wheel. The motor was geared to the track, so when the engine was started, the motor dragged the track toward it, causing the wheel to move. The center of gravity was low to keep the wheel from tipping over. The weight of the motor and driver was sufficient to keep them parallel to the ground. If the driving apparatus was light enough, the motor could climb the geared track rather than hauling it and the associated wheel around. Speeds of 30 miles per hour were comfortably achieved with two people in the seat. When the driver turned the wheel, the latticework in front of his eyes disappeared. He flashed so quickly that he could see clearly down the road. Purvis created two prototypes. The larger one had a 2.5 horsepower gasoline motor, which was adequate to propel the 1,000 pound wheel. The other operated on electricity. Purvis created a bus version in 1935 with larger seating capacity. If not for steering and braking issues, one-wheeled electric cars and buses might have taken over the highways and altered the course of automotive history. 18. Baby Cage Dangling baby cages gained popularity following its invention in 1922, although their true origins may be traced back to Dr. Luther Emmett Holt's 1884 book, The Care and Feeding of Children. Emmett outlines in detail how babies must be aired in his book. Fresh air is required to renew and purify the blood, and this is just as necessary for health and growth as proper food, according to him. The appetite is improved, the digestion is better, the cheeks become red, and all signs of health are seen. Essentially, the belief was that this was part of a process to toughen the newborns and make them more resistant to common colds. It was believed that exposing infants to cold temperatures, both outside and through cold water bathing, would provide them with immunity to mild ailments. While specialists like Dr. Luther Emmett Holt recommended merely setting an infant's basket near an open window, other parents went a step farther. Eleanor Roosevelt, who said she knew absolutely nothing about handling or feeding a baby, purchased a chicken wire cage following the birth of her daughter Anna. She hung it out the window of her New York City apartment and brought Anna inside for naps, but a concerned neighbor threatened to denounce her to the authorities. Emma Reed of Spokane, Washington, filed the first commercial patent for a baby cage in 1922. The cages gained popularity in London in the 1930s among apartment dwellers who lacked access to backyards. It is unclear when the popularity of the baby cage began to diminish, but it was most likely due to increased worries about child safety in the second part of the 20th century. 17. Ronald McDonald Clowns used to be everywhere. The kids couldn't get enough of them. They had clowns at their birthday parties, clowns on their bedsheets, and clowns on their televisions. Wherever there were children, there was certainly a clown around. So, what would you do if you wanted to entice children into, say, a restaurant? Of course, you bought yourself a clown. This is what happened in 1960, when Oscar Goldstein, a McDonald's franchisee in Washington, D.C., chose to support his local television station's production of Bozo's Circus, which starred future Today weatherman and national treasure Willard Scott, as the titular Bozo the Clown. The effort paid off, increasing McDonald's business in the Washington, D.C. area by 30%, because once again, boomer babies adored clowns. A few years later, Willard Scott's career as Bozo came to an end, and Goldstein decided to make him an offer he couldn't refuse. Goldstein offered Scott the opportunity to construct a clown character and sell burgers on regional television, filling children's hearts with a sense that was absolutely, positively not bone-chilling horror. Willard Scott was a skilled showman and accepted Goldstein's offer. Scott came up with the idea for Ronald McDonald, the Hamburger Happy Clown, which featured a cardboard box cap, a paper cup nose, and the magical power to make hamburgers in the area surrounding his belly button. That's the kind of high-quality entertainment that youngsters used to rave about. Scott soon began filming a second commercial, which appeared to imply that children should never accept food from strangers. But if that someone was a clown, it was perfectly fine. 16. A real-life UFO In the early 1950s, Canada attempted to construct a supersonic vertical takeoff and landing fighter bomber, which became known as the Avro car. However, its round shape resembled a flying saucer from science fiction films of the day. Avro Canada's design concept for the Avro car was based on using turbojet engine exhaust to power a circular turbo rotor that generated thrust. By directing this push downward, the turbo rotor creates an air cushion that allows the aircraft to float at low altitude. When thrust was delivered to the back, the aircraft accelerated and gained altitude. The first prototype, the Avro car on exhibit, was sent to NASA. Wind tunnel experiments revealed that the aircraft lacked enough control for high-speed flying and was aerodynamically unstable. 
the second Avrocar prototype performed flight tests, which corroborated the wind tunnel results. The Avrocar demonstrated uncontrollable pitch and roll motions when it flew more than three feet above ground, which the Avro engineers dubbed hubcapping. The Avrocar could only achieve a top speed of 35 miles per hour, and all attempts to stop the hubcapping failed. The project was canceled in December 1961. 15. Inflatable Furniture, 1968. Do you remember inflatable furniture? If you were a fan of Delia's catalog in the late 1990s, you will. However, the plastic sofas and chairs were not invented during the Britney Spears era. For the first inflatable chair, we'll have to go back 30 years to the 1960s. The US military began experimenting with inflatable constructions in the 1940s, albeit they were not yet considered furniture. Engineer Walter Byrd designed a series of ray domes, inflatable domes constructed of fiberglass cloth to shelter the radar antennae that monitored the sky over the Arctic in Canada and Alaska. Byrd went on to design a series of air-supported structures for civilian usage, including the pool enclosure shown above. By the 1960s, inflatables had taken on a bit of a countercultural connotation. 1967 saw the founding of the House Rucker Co., an avant-garde architectural collective that challenged existing ideas of what buildings could be, often using inflatable structures. 1967 also saw the introduction of Blow, the first mass-produced inflatable chair. Designers were fixated on inflatables throughout the 1960s. The 1968 exhibit in Paris showcased a wide range of fantastical inflatable constructions, including an inflatable pavilion replete with inflatable furnishings. That same year, Vietnam-born designer Quasar Khan launched Aerospace, a collection of inflatable furniture featuring blow-up chairs, sofas, tables, and even lamps in groovy 60s patterns. Inflatable furniture returned in the late 1990s, which is probably when most viewers remember it. Although it was popular for a while, inflatable furniture in the 1990s suffered from the same issues that plagued IKEA designers. Sagging, discomfort, and almost inconveniently lightweight. This, however, hasn't kept a new generation of designers from experimenting with inflatables. 14. Football Helmet Every now and then, an image appears on the internet of a man wearing a helmet as he crashes headfirst into a wall. The image, which looks to date from the early 20th century, is supposedly a test of a football helmet's effectiveness. This humorous video shows a man testing his American football helmet innovation, which he believes would avoid fatalities and injuries. He has several men kick him in the head and bash him with a baseball bat before he rushes headfirst into a wall, only to fall back on his derriere thereafter. In case you're wondering, this video was shot in 1932. 13. Wing Suit Flying Franz Karl Reichelt, also known as Henry Francois Reichelt after his French naturalization, was an Austro-Hungarian-born French tailor, inventor, and parachuting pioneer, sometimes referred to as the Flying Tailor, who died by jumping from the Eiffel Tower while testing a wearable parachute he designed. Reichelt had grown obsessed with creating a suit for aviators that could turn into a parachute and allow them to survive a fall if forced to abandon their aircraft in midair. Although he constructed and experimented with numerous prototypes of wings and parachute suits over the years, they were largely unsuccessful, to the point where it was a source of disagreement between newspapers after his death as to whether any of his designs were ever practical. 12. Full-on Airship Rescue On April 15, 1928, the dirigible Italia took off from Milan, Italy, intending to become the second airship to reach the North Pole. Over a month later, on the 24th of May, Expedition Commander Umberto Nobile transmitted a triumphant radio message to a ship anchored at the airship's base camp near Ni Alasund in the Norwegian archipelago of Svalbard, stating that the mission was successful. It would be the base camp's last message from Italy. Ten days later, a teenage Russian with a homemade radio detected a desperate SOS broadcast from 1,180 kilometers away. On its return route, the Italia crashed on sea ice north of Svalbard leaving nine survivors who were desperately trying to contact the base ship to send rescue. The shipwrecked crew could hear a news station from Rome, 2,485 miles away, but no matter what frequency they used, their calls for aid could not reach their camp on the other side of the Svalbard Islands. The stranded crew was eventually rescued after several weeks on the ice. 11. Nor Soup Creepy Advert, 1985 The commercial in this video was broadcasted in 1985 for Nor Soup. It shows a scarecrow waking up in a field after it begins to rain. The scarecrow begins to dance, probably a tribute to the movie Singing in the Rain. As he moves from location to location in the rain, 
until a man lets him in his house to get a taste of the amazing Nor soup. I personally find the scarecrow fun to watch, but kind of creepy at the end of the video after he slurps some of the soup. What about you? Let us know if this commercial frightened you in the comments below. 10. TV Helmet Around 50 years ago, a man wore a submarine-style white helmet that spanned from front to back. His entire head vanished into the futurist capsule, with only the title indicating what was happening. The TV helmet, invented in 1967, is a technological gadget that isolates the user while immersing him or her in an endless network of information. Blocked off from the outside world, the wearer is entirely focused on the screen in front of his eyes. Walter Peechler created TV Helmet, which not only formally anticipates the cyber glasses developed decades later, but also articulates content questions in relation to the media experience long before the virtual world was discovered. Walter Pickler was most likely already a media critic at the time, but he was also a philosophically thinking artist who began to investigate space outside of the four walls and architecture of cities. Pickler named his innovation the portable living room. His groundbreaking creations, the prototypes, were pneumatic plastic living bubbles from the 1960s that sought answers to problems about tomorrow's customized life somewhere between design, architecture, and art. Pickler's futurist sculptures, with their references to spaceflight and modernist materials, evoked a desire for the future, even if his statements were claimed to be skeptical or cynical in tone. 9. Swimming Lessons In Killaloe, County Clare, an alternative technique of swimming teaching was highly successful. Killaloe, County Clare, is located on the banks of the Shannon River. Many youngsters from Killaloe and surrounding Bellina congregated at Pierhead on a regular basis for swimming lessons, which were taught by Peter Lacey. Over a hundred youngsters were able to swim confidently and enjoy the water thanks to this volunteer swimming instructor, who also worked as a painter and decorator. It was never a case of flinging them into the deep end. All newcomers learned safely with the help of a rope harness. This popular hobby was facilitated by a man who stated that his teaching was completely theoretical. He himself did not swim. In the absence of a communal swimming pool, Peter Lacey decided a few years ago to conduct swimming lessons in the River Shannon himself. As a founding member of the local swimming club, he received sound advice from an experienced swimmer. He was assured by an experienced gentleman that if he performed the leg kick and arm movement, everything would be okay. The quantity of young youngsters enthusiastically splashing around in the Shannon served as proof that Peter Lacey's lessons worked. This man enabled all the town's children to swim and have a great time. 8. First London Olympics Game, 1908 The 1908 Olympic Games were originally awarded to Rome, but were rescheduled for London when it became clear that Rome would not be ready. Despite the short notice, the games were extremely well organized. For the first time, a stadium was built specifically for the games, and swimming competitions were not held in open water. Dorando Pietri of Italy entered the stadium at the end of the marathon, and it was immediately clear that something was amiss. Dazed, he went in the wrong direction and collapsed. The officials assisted him in crossing the finish line in first position. Therefore, he was disqualified for getting outside assistance, but his bravery gained him immortality. Sportsmanship existed on a scale unfathomable in today's more competitive environment. One excellent example occurred when the middleweight Greco-Roman wrestling final between Frithjof Martinson and Moritz Anderson was rescheduled for one day to allow Martinson to heal from a minor injury. Martinson successfully rebounded and won. The marathon was the most noteworthy event of the 1908 Games. The Games Organizing Committee set the marathon course at 42 kilometers and 195 meters, with the final 195 meters added to justify the route from Windsor Castle to the Royal Box in the London Stadium. This distance became official beginning with the 1924 Games. 7. Entering the Fifth Wheel This 100-year-old video shows how cars back in the days were capable of automatically releasing their fifth wheel located at the back of the vehicle. With the push of a button, the wheel would snap out of position and slide to the ground, allowing the car to rotate 360 degrees so it could easily swerve out of a parking space, as you can see in the video. It's surprising to see the sort of gadgets that were invented such a long time ago. 6. Giant Human Chess In this movie, we return to Leningrad in 1924. Peter Romanovsky and Ilya Rabinovich, two chess masters at the time, competed in an unusual chess encounter. They apparently called in their moves over the phone and had real-life chess pieces, humans and horses, move around a massive chessboard that covered Palace Square. The black pieces were made up of Red Army soldiers, while the white ones were made up of Soviet Navy sailors. The annual five-hour contest aimed to promote chess in the Soviet Union. 5. 
total electronic home. Believe it or not, in the late 1950s, Westinghouse provided advertising materials for 16 different all-electric home floor plans built by five different architects, each priced at $10 and ranging in size from 900 to 2,000 square feet. The architects were also commissioned to design model homes in various parts of the country. The Westinghouse Total Electric Home was officially opened for public visits on Sunday, April 24, 1960. The house, which measured 1,604 square feet, featured two courtyard sections known as outdoor living centers, three bedrooms, a living room, an entertainment center, and a food preparation center situated in the center of a big open area. Visitors were asked to take note of the built-in appliances, as Westinghouse intended visitors to imagine it as a home manager with numerous electrical helpers, rather than traditional techniques. To think visionaries at Westinghouse imagined this 64 years ago is mind-boggling. 4. Footage of San Francisco, 1906 This film footage of San Francisco in 1906 has been repaired, with a sky visual effect applied. This was Market Street on April 14, 1906, four days before San Francisco's earthquake and fire. A motion picture camera mounted on the front of a cable car captured a trip down Market Street between 8th and 9th Streets, then eastward to the cable car turnaround at the Ferry Building. The Miles brothers, who worked as moving picture photographers, produced the film. A few days later, the Miles brothers were on their way to New York when they learned of the earthquake. They sent the negative to New York and returned to San Francisco to find their studios had been destroyed. For many decades, the film's origin remained a mystery, and it was long assumed to have been filmed in September of 1905, after being dated as such by the Library of Congress based on the state of construction of various structures. However, in 2009 and 2010, film historian David Keane, co-founder of the Niles Film Museum in Niles, California, dated the film to the spring of 1906 using automobile registrations and weather data. Keane eventually discovered promotional papers from the film's first release, dating it to April 14, 1906, and finally crediting the directors, the Miles Brothers. 3. How Cartoon Popeye Made Without Computer This fascinating and informative 1938 film, part of the popular science series, takes viewers on a tour of Fleischer Studios' newly built Miami studio during the production of the classic Popeye film, Aladdin and His Wonderful Lamp. The talented artist can be seen hard at work as they flesh out drawings for the 2D cartoon. In extremely early cartoons, the entire frame, including the backdrop, characters, and items, was created on a single sheet of paper and photographed. Everything had to be redrawn for each frame with movement, which was tedious work and required many artists to complete, as you can see in the video. It's incredible to see how simple black and white drawings came to life in beautiful, animated color. 2. Model T Ford Assembly Line One prevalent fallacy is that Henry Ford invented the vehicle. This is not correct. While he did not invent the automobile, he did pioneer a new method of manufacturing multiple vehicles. The moving assembly line was the mode of production used. The conveyor belt was the most typical feature on this production line. Belts were employed in a variety of sectors, including slaughterhouses. Moving the product to the worker looked to be a more efficient use of time and resources. The Ford Motor Company team decided to test incorporating the moving assembly line into the automotive manufacturing process. Following much trial and error, Henry Ford and his team successfully implemented this idea at the Highland Park Assembly Factory. The moving element was what distinguished this assembly line from others. Henry Ford famously stated that the use of a moving assembly line allowed work to be brought to workers rather than the worker having to move to and around the vehicle. The automobile started being dragged down the line and manufactured step by step. It was initially dragged by a rope before evolving into a basic moving chain system. The innovative procedure allowed the Model T to be constructed in only 90 minutes. 1. Miniature Roadster Alf Tab was a bike shop owner and trick cyclist from Kidderminster, Worcestershire. He is well-renowned for creating and riding small bicycles, as demonstrated in the video. In 1938, Tab, like his father, fashioned a 15-inch bicycle to display outside his shop as a promotional gimmick. Curious whether he could ride the bicycle, he tried it and discovered he could, with a little practice. He was then urged to showcase his act at the nearby glider drone. This inspired Tab to create other miniature cycles, including an 18-inch tandem and a miniature penny farthing with a 12-inch front wheel. Tab, his daughter Peggy and granddaughter Pauline, then performed trick cycling for television audiences in the United Kingdom and America. He also achieved a world record for uncontested riding a 12-inch tiny bicycle. For more than 40 years, no one could beat Tab at pedaling the 12-inch cycle more than five yards. 
Tab's final formal performance was at a mayor's ball in 1974, when he was 91 years old and still able to ride his 12-inch miniature bicycle. Tab died in 1976, aged 93. I don't know about you, but some of these videos blew my mind, especially the Westinghouse home concept in the 1960s. Which one was your favorite? Why don't you let us know in the comments below? Well, that's it for now. If you enjoyed this video, please give us a like and let us know in the comments what you think. Check out our other videos and subscribe to be part of the fun. Click on the notification icon so you can see our new videos as soon as they're uploaded. Thanks for watching and see you next time.